So, uh, dear all, uh, my name is Patrick Ransfield of the in-house community, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to the Asia, Middle East and Africa and UK time-friendly Women in Law webinar on the topic of Is COVID-19 Taking Women's Careers Back to the 1950s? The webinar is moderated by Sally Dyson of Firm Sense and starts with a 15-minute presentation from Christina Blacklaws, former president of the uh, Law Society of England and Wales. A big thank you to our supporters who have made it possible for this to be a free to attend webinar. Sally and Christina will be joined by a fantastic panel, which includes Georgia Dawson, Hanim Hamza, Neelam Kyle, uh, Quinn Hong, Serena Turner, and uh, Shrutri Ajitsara, Wei Wen Wang, and Yossa Hamza. The discussion will last for 70 minutes uh, and will prove both stimulating and illuminating. If you'd like to ask questions during the webinar, please make full use of the chat box in the usual way. And Sally and I will, uh, Sally will either address the questions during the discussion if they're relevant, and we will do our very best to answer all the questions. We've got over 130 people registered. Today. Sorry, we've got over 430 people registered today. Uh, so um, that's fantastic. And 12% of those are men. So a quick word about the in-house community. Sorry, those are the bios that I didn't uh, show you. So a quick word about the in-house community. Um, the in-house community was founded in 1998 and its mission it's to empower and educate in-house counsel for the benefit of all. We have over 20,000 members altogether from Tokyo to the United Kingdom. And in the pre-COVID days, we would host 17 in-house congresses annually. Over 2,400 2, in-house counsel across Asia, the Middle East, and also South Africa attended at least one of our in-house congresses in 2019. And the gender profile of uh, about 2,400 delegates, 60% female. Interestingly enough, the proportion of women GCs to men is a lower percentage, but is over 51%. However, whilst this is less than the men uh, by much more, much more uh, a healthy um, statistic than for the UK. However, in my opinion, this is not any room for complacency, as the in-house career for lawyers in emerging markets is actually relatively new. And in the 1950s, during the early days of technology in North America, over 30% of engineers were women, a statistic that is beyond the current situation in Silicon Valley today. During Christina's presentation, and also during Sally's, we will be provided with useful data to help frame our discussion. And one institution you may hear quoted is the UK-based Institute of Fiscal Studies. Uh, their work indicates that the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely affected women's careers adversely. But at least the UK does allow the collection of data. To quote Cathy O'Neill, author of Weapons of Math Destruction, data is really, it's not really neutral. In fact, it is the opposite of neutral. In the United States, during the first year of the Trump administration, House Republicans passed a bill that actually stopped the use of federal money to measure both gender and racial pay gaps. In an interesting article uh, by FT's uh, Philip Stevens called The Path from COVID to a New Social Contract, Stevens uses the metaphor, and I've borrowed it, of the four ripples coming from a water drop to illustrate the impact COVID and of the COVID pandemic over time. And uh, the first impact, uh, fear, illness, and death. Second one, indirect health results, missed cancer, unintended consequences. The third one is social and economic impact, rising joblessness and economic impact. And the fourth one is choices for the future, um, either a nationalistic route or forging a new and better shared future. In my final comments, I'm going to focus on the fourth circle, as this is to some degree where I believe we are presently. We are what anthropologists describe as the liminal stage or the liminal moment. A liminal moment is one in which participants in an event or trauma 
and in this pandemic we are all participants after all stand at a threshold between their previous ways of structuring their identity time and community and a new way two macroeconomic examples come to mind the resulting choices to the global situation following the first world war and the choices made after the second world war the choices made after the first world war veered towards protectionism and nationalism encapsulated in the grossly unfair and colonialistic treaty of versailles and that led actually to the second world war the choices made by almost all the international community of nations following the second world war led to the founding of international institutions some of which we know extremely well like the international bar association the world bank World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, and the IMF. But great as they are, all the above relate to either economic or legal change, and not social change. Social change, especially for women, actually went backwards during the 1950s. As we will discover, COVID-19 has brought much suffering, but it has also pressed the reset button. We could go either backwards or forwards. For the legal profession in all its guises, leaders prepared to listen, to offer competence, fairness and empathy, they definitely have an audience. And it is an opportunity for all of us, all human beings. We cannot waste this chance. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope you can see me and hear me now. And thank you, first of all, Patrick, for that incredibly powerful introduction to our webinar. And thank you to everybody who has joined us today. We've been quite overwhelmed, actually, by the response that we received to our webinar. Um, we were never in any doubt that this was an important topic, but your enthusiastic sign up has really showed us how much this subject resonates with people all around the globe. I have a question for Patrick, actually. Patrick, um, you've, you've spoken so uh, passionately about the times we live in. I'd really like to know, and I expect our audience would too, though, about why you feel personally so invested in this subject of women lawyers' careers. Right, Sally, thank you. Um, well, things, uh, three things immediately come to mind. Firstly, having worked uh, as a non-partner for two international law firms, um, I can attest at first hand to the very male, feudalistic and caste-like mindset that one or two, or maybe more um, of the partners, not all of them, but some of the partners have, whether consciously or unconsciously. Uh, secondly, at second hand, I heard during the global financial crisis of 2008-2009 about one disgusted senior partner shared with me from an English firm about the bloodbath that came as a consequence um, of that crisis and the redundancies, which actually cut across all the hard work which had been done before. So all the 360 reviews, all the purported uh, views about diversity and inclusion, they went all out of the window at the consequence and this one firm maybe others too and i really do not want to see that happen again and the third actually concerns my mother and her career uh, my mother pauline drake as she was graduated joined the workforce and then became a mother during the 1950s um, a decade before women in britain including my mother's mother had become a vital workforce during the second world war in the uk however from the 50s to the early 70s the old patriarchy had finally and firmly established itself, so much so that even under the socialist Wilson government in the early 70s, my father was punitively taxed as a consequence of having a wife who had the audacity to want to have a career. Uh, it seemed unfair to me as an eight-year-old then, and it seems where we are potentially could be unfair to me as an adult today, and that's my, that's my passion for this. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, incredibly clear, strongly held and quite personal reasons um, for wanting to host this webinar today. But I'm sure some of those thoughts will um, strike a chord with people in our audience today. For myself, my personal motivation uh, for wanting to speak on this webinar was partly my own experience as a working mother, uh, working through this, this pandemic, but also in the past few months, I found um, that whenever I jumped onto a phone call or a video call with another senior professional woman, 
the first thing they wanted to talk about with me was their own struggle with homeschooling, with housework, and juggling that with their professional lives. I found that um, when I was speaking to men, um, they might mention that our call might be interrupted by a child wandering in, but really they were able to leave it there. By contrast, the women that I spoke to um, seemed really heavily burdened by increased pressures of having their children at home with them whilst trying to hold down important jobs. And so, and so this juggling act, this, these issues about whether their careers were sustainable in the situation became really dominant themes. Those are the anecdotes, but actually um, there have, have been plenty of academic studies as well um, that really support this idea of, of the uh, disproportionate burden that women seem to be bearing during this pandemic. Um, there's a project known as the First 100 Years Project. Um, they were set up to celebrate 100 years of women being allowed to practice as lawyers in the UK. And they found, for example, that nine out of 10 women took on more childcare responsibilities during lockdown here in the UK. And a third of those people were forced to reduce their working hours as a result because they just couldn't manage both functions. Um, half of the women they surveyed reported that they were taking on, or they certainly felt they were taking on more of the domestic burden than their male partners. These statistics actually were of particular relevance to high earning professionals such as lawyers, because actually they found that this unequal burden of childcare and domestic responsibilities, it was falling even more heavily on women in high earning households, um, including where both parents were high earners. And yet it was the, the, the mother um, who was um, taking on uh, more of the childcare responsibilities and scaling back their work. Um, the Institute for Fiscal Studies that Patrick mentioned earlier, um, they found that on average, these increased chores meant that women were only able to perform about a third of the amount of paid work that men were able to perform, uh, which I think is really quite shocking. And also 47 women or mothers, in particular mothers, were 47% more likely than fathers to have either lost their jobs during COVID or to have felt that they had to resign uh, because they could not sustain their home responsibilities with their jobs. So statistics like this um, are really clearly showing uh, how women's equality and careers are at severe risk of setback um, during this crisis. But, but I feel very strongly that this doesn't have to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Patrick has talked about the extraordinary times that we're in, the fact that we are having to question how we run our lives and our businesses, um, but as well as the threats we face, there are opportunities. So in, hope, in hosting this webinar today, we really hope to shine a light both on the realities for women around the globe, but also crucially to discuss solutions and opportunities. As Patrick mentioned, we've got a stellar cast um, on the panel today uh, to talk about whether COVID-19 is taking women lawyers' careers back to the 1950s. And um, it would be my pleasure to ask each of our panelists in turn uh, for their perspectives, experience and advice. But first, to set the scene, I will invite in a moment Christina Blacklaws, um, who is now a consultant at Blacklaws Consulting, but is actually the immediate past president of the Law Society of England and Wales um, to speak to us. She led a terrifically important research project on women in the law that has resulted in a suite of practical recommendations, both for women, but also for male champions of change. And so I will now invite Christina to switch on her camera and her microphone and to explain to us some of the key lessons from her research. Hello, welcome, Christina. Oh, hi, Sally. And it's a great pleasure to be here with you all. And thank you so much for inviting me. Um, now, we had a little bit of a technical issue earlier on, so um, we're going to be doing a double act, Patrick and I. I'm going to be doing the talking, he's going to be making the slides move. What could go wrong? Um, okay, so, so first of all, let me say that um, I am an absolute passionate advocate for gender equality. I have been 
throughout my life. But when I became an office holder and president at the Law Society of England and Wales, I had a real opportunity then to, to spearhead this project. And, and why did I want to do that? Well, because I think gender equality is good for everyone. It's not just about 50% of us, it's about 100% of us. It works as well for, for men as well as it does for women. It works incredibly well for people with other protected characteristics. It, it liberates us all from our stereotypes and allows us to, to thrive in a, in a diverse, and supportive in working environment. And if that hasn't convinced you, well, I can make out a very hard nosed business case as to why gender equality is important. Research report after report evidences that it equates with profitability. So why are we even having to talk about it now? Um, well, I'm afraid we are by no means anywhere near equality yet. And um, I'm gonna be talking about the, the UK here, but actually um, our research was global. And I'm sure what I say will resonate with every woman lawyer across the world. So in the UK, um, for the last pretty much 30 years, since 1991, women have represented the majority of entrants into the, uh, into the law. Um, and indeed, in the last 15 years, about two thirds of the new entrants have been women. But as you can see from this, and, and you can see that women represent just over 50, 51, 52% of, um, of practicing lawyers. But the biggest figure we could get to in terms of partners, so women leaders in private law practice, was 31%. And indeed, in, um, in our largest legal practices, our large global practices, the percentage of women owners, quite often you'll struggle to find 15% female ownership. So we have this systemic problem where although women are coming in great numbers into the law, they are not breaking through that glass ceiling. So we wanted to investigate that. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so we undertook um, a global survey, it ended up being the largest ever global survey around what were the barriers um, to women progressing their careers in law. And you can see here the, the, what, the largest barrier, the thing that was felt by most people to be the predominant um, barrier for women to, to progress in their career was unconscious. And I would add to that conscious bias. 49% of people recognised that there was an unacceptable work-life balance to reach the, the upper echelons of their career. And 46% and were concerned about what I would call the sort of male-shaped way of, of um, legal practice. So traditional networks and routes to, to promotion and to business development, and those being really quite, quite male orientated. So we use the insights from our survey for our qualitative part of the research, which we undertook by round tables. So we did 250 round tables in 19 countries involving thousands of women and, and men. Uh, next slides, please, Patrick. Um, oh, I forgot that one, sorry. <laughs> so gender pay gap is also, or equal pay gap was also a major, major issue from our research. Um, so in the next few slides, please, Patrick. Um, these are just slides of our, our round tables, the people who attended them. If we could move on to the toolkit slide. And those were where they were. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, we created specific toolkits, um, one for women and, and one for, for the men's roundtable to, to focus us on the primary issues, but also equally importantly to encourage 
everyone to be activists for gender equality in their organisations and in their communities. Uh, next slide. We grouped the key findings into three research reports, one for the um, UK findings, one for the men's roundtables and one for the international findings. And overwhelmingly, we found at every stage um, of a woman's career, there are barriers which prevent her really from fulfilling her potential. And um, with a few exceptions, women lawyers still don't uniformly occupy um, their roles which are commensurate with their wishes, their qualifications, their experience, and indeed sheer numbers. So the next slide, please, Keith. So some of the insights um, from the report. Um, from the domestic women's roundtables, firstly, a finding that not fitting that traditional image of what it takes to be a business leader, how those archetypal characteristics are very male, whereas female traits were often undervalued or indeed seen negatively. Um, that having a lack of representation, so not having women like like me, um, at the um, in leadership roles, had a profound effect, particularly on junior lawyers who needed to see female role models to to know and to feel that they had senior leadership potential. This next one's really important. So assumptions. Um, that are made about women have a corrosive impact on our ambition. So being presumed to be the tea girl, the note taker, more junior to your junior male colleague can be demoralizing and undermining of our confidence. So these assumptions of inferiority really impact negatively on, on women's desire to, um, to progress their careers. And perhaps most worryingly and significantly, the impact of intersectionality. Time and again, we heard from women who had more than one protected characteristic um, about how their career paths had been um, disadvantaged, how many barriers, additional barriers that they had in place. Next slide, please. Um, from the men's round tables, um, there was a real emphasis here on um, the recognition, the recognition that women are not in senior leadership percent positions and that is a real problem and the need to look further down the female talent pipeline to ensure that women at early stages of their careers got the same opportunities and experiences as their male colleagues. Next slide please. With the uh, international work and I was so fortunate myself to facilitate 48 roundtables in 18 different countries. Um, but with the international work, um, I had assumed that women's experiences would differ widely across the world. But actually, what our research found was that um, although some accounts from some jurisdictions were eye-watering, the challenges and the experiences of female lawyers are very similar across the globe. So those are shared experiences in relation to traditional gender roles and stereotypes, gender pay disparity and the lack of flexible working. Um, and particularly working mothers were penalized because of their caring responsibilities. So this is all pre-COVID, um, so which I'll, we'll talk about in a minute, the, the additional impact of COVID. But even before that, women were facing these disadvantages. So I'm going to very quickly run to um, some of the solutions that we found because I've probably depressed you by now. So next slide, please, Patrick. So in spite of the barriers, we found um, that so there are things that really work well. So access to and mainstreaming flexible working for men as well as women. It mustn't just be a mummy track. Networking, having visible role models and promoting and celebrating them. Again, male role models as well as female role models. Um, mentoring and sponsorship 
and, and perhaps really crucially, engaging men in this debate. It's, it's vital that male leaders see this as their responsibility and they feel accountable and are held accountable for ensuring um, diversity in the leadership around the board uh, table. Next slide, please. So um, some of the uh, thematic solutions that come from our three reports, leadership, leaders walking the talk, um, leading from the top and by way of example, absolutely crucial, having diversity and inclusion at the heart of all business planning, again, is vital. Transparency is key. What we found is when there is a lack of transparency, particularly around compensation, remuneration, women always come off worse. Um, and of, of course, training. We all have unconscious or implicit biases. Um, we carry those around with us, but we are quite frankly dangerous if we are making decisions about other people without that awareness. Um, and, and having the right policies in place, always say it's not about fixing the women, it is about fixing the systems to ensure that there is fairness there. Next slide, please. Um, so what we did is we put this together into a blueprint for gender balance, which sort of distills everything that organisations and firms and businesses need to do. Next slide. And uh, and finally, we um, we pulled together a women in law pledge. Now, this is a UK base. It's supported by all of the representative bodies in, in the UK and by the UK government. However, um, it has international application. Um, people, organisations who commit to the pledge promise to work together to tackle discrimination and bullying and harassment and challenge gender pay gaps, appointing senior and accountable champions, addressing discriminatory workplace cultures and bias and publishing targets and being accountable to action plans um, and I would really urge everybody listening to um, next slide please and and on to the final slide um, to 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 very to, to have a look at this um, pledge I'm very happy my email address is there please contact me if you want the pack of documentation that I've been talking about um, if we could all get our businesses to sign up to this pledge it would be quite frankly transformational for gender equality um, so thank you very much for listening to that Hello, Christina, thank you so much for those incredibly rich insights and also for your very generous offer, uh, making yourself available for those who want to contact you. I believe also that some of the materials are also available on the in-house community website in the hub that they've specially created on this topic. Um, so um, it, it's wonderful to have actions that people can can actually take. Um, I'm. Um, I just wanted to ask you before um, we uh, move on to our first poll, perhaps if you could just indicate if you had to pick one thing, what would be the biggest opportunity that you see arising uh, for enhancing gender equality coming out of this COVID crisis? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, but I would, I would say that as a matter of principle, anything which disrupts the status quo has got to be a good opportunity for people who have been disadvantaged by the status quo. And I include women and, and, and people with other protected characteristics um, in that. Um, so, so I do think there is this significant opportunity here. Um, what, where I think that the biggest opportunity is probably around flexible and agile working uh, and the normalization of that. Uh, one of the big barriers to women progressing was around presenteeism. 
you know the fact that if you're if you're not there in the office at the right time you're not going to get the good work but but actually a more virtual world enables more automation and um and more objectivity when it comes to the allocation of work and opportunities and also i i think you know anything that disrupts the sort of um barroom culture in terms of business development is going to be again good for women so so i do think there are um some real opportunities here as patrick said there's but there's no room for any complacency um, if we are going to embed these things into a post-covid world practice then we really need to work hard to make sure that um that those opportunities continue to be available Thank you, Christina. Um, uh, well done for answering that question that I threw at you. Um, um, so um, in a moment, we will go to our first poll. I will say thank you. Um, I'll ask you to, to mute and to switch off your camera now. Um, before going to the first poll, I'm seeing questions coming in through the, the chat. Um, and where there's time, I, I will try to, to handle some of those or direct them to panelists as we go along. Um, there's uh, one that's really caught my eye um, at this stage, um, asking, I think in response to my opening remarks, perhaps, about women whose careers have suffered in lockdown, asking about whether it's just a case of maternal instinct coming in, whether it's just natural that women take the primary responsibility for childcare. Um, if, if we have time later, it may be that there are other panellists who have different views. My own personal take on it is that, yes, the maternal instinct is often very strong um, and, um, and perhaps many mothers naturally take on that work. But actually, I, I, I think a lot of things about building awareness of both women and men to think that just because you've always done something one way doesn't mean you have to always continue doing it that way. And also for building awareness um, amongst men of the, the many uh, tasks to be done and responsibilities and to have open discussions about sharing um, out those tasks and responsibilities. Um, and I do think that change is possible and that it's not something that is just purely genetically hard, hardwired. That's my personal take on it. If there's time later, we may be able to come back to that and make that a, a, wider, a wider panel discussion. But for now, um, what I would like to do is to actually ask all of you um, a question. And so Rahul, I will ask you if you could please pull up our first poll. Thank you very much. And so that question is, what in your view is the impact of COVID on gender equality within your organisation? A, has gender equality suffered? B, has there been no change? Or C, has gender equality improved in your organisation during the pandemic? Please submit your answers to the poll. So Rahul, if you if you think people have had enough time, um, I think you're able to see the answers coming in better than I can. If you feel people have had enough time, um, let's see if we can uh, see the responses. Um, I think I'm just receiving the responses now, if you bear with me a second, and I can see uh, that 24% um, of people feel that gender equality has suffered. 66%, oh, thank you, I can now see it on the screen. 66% uh, say no change and 9% say improved. Um, so I think that's really fascinating. And I think it's probably a reflection of the very international nature of this webinar um, that we're seeing these results. And there may be some distinct regional differences. So that's really fascinating insights, thank you, that we'll be able to bear in mind as we um, continue our panel discussion. And it is now my pleasure to call on Yossa Hamza. Um, Yossa, please do um, uh, turn on your camera if you can and, uh, and unmute yourself. Um, welcome. Sure. Um, and the question I particularly would like to ask you is, what do you see from your experience in the Middle East as being the real challenges to get more women into the legal profession? Um, I think in, in my personal experience, it's really the cultural mindset. Um, I mean, the society perceive women and also how women perceive themselves. Um, the law, if you go to the law school, law students, um, female ones, outnumber the male students in law schools. However, if you go to the market itself, it's still male oriented. You have, um, you have male peers and you also have a, a lot of male um, oriented activities. 
I'm not trying to diminish my male peers, but I'm an advocate of diversity. It truly really serves everyone. The more diverse a team is, um, the more effective and innovative it will be. But there is still this stereotypical image of how women um, needs to look like and what the role is. So this kind of culture mindset will leads really um, effectively to having unfair laws and regulations um, in many of the countries that we cover. Um, it's not really working in women's favor, whether it's short maternity leaves, whether the expectation for the women to be really in the office present. Um, I mean, unex uh, unfair expectations as well from um, in the working environment. Um, your manager expects you to work additional hours regardless of what you have in your personal life or um, those that kind of unflexible working environment and working hours. I think being also unpaid equally in the market, um, you still have the kind of mindset that you're a woman, you're supposed to be a housewife, and accordingly, even if you work, you can still be paid less. Um, that kind of peer connecting, I mean, if you work in a law firm, and I'm sure a lot of the peers here um, will relate, is that a lot of the peer connecting activities um, that happen in law firms are usually after working hours. Um, it's fine for the male peer to leave his family to to really, I would say, ditch um, his house responsibilities. But it's for the woman. It's ex she's expected to be at home, really after her work, um, after 6 p.m. to take care of the kids, to take care of the house, and then her husband, regardless of what his um, job is, he's expected to do whatever he wants. I think the unequal representation of managerial. Um, roles and the lack of role models for women um, in the region as well is a huge impact. I mean, I personally was unable to find um, a role model when I uh, first graduated. It was like, if you find like 10 male peers, there's possibly one female in a managerial role, uh, whether in-house or even in a partner position. And accordingly, there is this kind of mindset, there's like you're expected to be a male to progress in your career. So I think the kind of culture mindset leads to a lot of un, um, unfair positions, whether it's inside the corporate environment, whether it's policies, laws and regulations, and also how women perceive themselves and what they're worth. So uh, thank you, uh, Yossa. I, I can hear that what you're describing, they're both barriers to entry to the profession and also barriers to progress in the profession. Um, and I think that that will apply equally. Uh, do you have, um, uh, very briefly, any suggestion for, you know, it's very hard for women to change the whole of society, but do you think there are any individual actions uh, that women can take to help improve their their career prospects I, in the region? Definitely. I mean, women are their own advocates. Um, it, it doesn't really need to, we're not expected to do huge change, but I think those kind of small steps that we take across our communities, speaking out for what we're worth will definitely make the huge impact long term. I mean, a decade ago, I personally didn't find any anyone in, in a managerial role. I mean, 10 years from now, you find a lot of women in managerial roles. So I think those kind of very small steps that each of us take across uh, among their smaller communities will make an effect. Women are their own advocates um, across 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 the communities. If we speak out, if we advocate for, for what we're worth, long term that will make an impact. Well, thank you, Yossa. So women as their own advocates, that's a message that I absolutely endorse. If I could ask you now to uh, step aside uh, and I am going to invite uh, Wei Wen Wang um, to um, open up her microphone and her camera now. Hello, Wei Wen, and welcome. Um, and I'm particularly interested to know about what your experience has been in China. Okay. Um, I actually feel very happy to um, paint a little bit different pictures in, in China. And uh, since China is, is, is huge, and then um, that's um, the, 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 the difference from region from region uh, is huge. So I probably what I just, I, I'm going to say is more representing uh, Shanghai. Uh, which uh, is a very well-developed city, and also um, the in-house industry. So I, I actually personally, um, because uh, the work experience in the law firm and the in-house, I, I feel quite a huge difference, right? 
and also the company you're working for. So I, I, I think I'm very fortunately, I, you know, to, 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 to enjoy all the good benefits for being in the right place, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the right company. Um, so I, and also because this round, the COVID-19, uh, although China start earlier, but if you look back, actually the actual lockdown for us is short, the shorter one is about uh, four, only four weeks, the longest maybe only eight weeks. So I will say, you know, I didn't really uh, observe uh, 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 significant impacts of the COVID-19 in the gender equality. Um, and overall, um, the gender equality, um, we are actually, I, I'm, I'm representing uh, the GC in our global uh, diversity and inclusion uh, board. And at uh, one time I have to make a joke that uh, the diversity, especially that, that gender diversity for this office is we need more men. Um, <laughs> we, um, for, for, for the office workers, we have more than 70% female workers. And the, the leader team, um, the uh, regional lead, leader team, we have more, more than half uh, female. And uh, for the legal department, uh, globally, um, the leader, uh, the leaders in the legal department, we are, we are almost two thirds female, and uh, my legal team here also two thirds female. And also in the pipeline of the future leaders, we see more female leaders uh, coming up. So I think uh, overall, it's really a constant journey uh, 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 about cu uh, the culture shaping. And also, uh, you know, that's that's a lot of. Um, I, I like. Uh, I actually uh, listened to the earlier speaker, Christine, talking about the role model is very important. Uh, role modeling is very important. Um, I have to say, you know, five years joined the company, we started from. Or we start to see more and more female leaders in our regional uh, uh, um, lead team. Before, when the lead team going to, we are in the hospitality industry. Um, the after after the meeting, after dinner time, is the pop culture. Now it's the tea time. <laughs> so you 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 know the the, the role model and then uh, the surrounding uh, uh, culture. I, I I feel like it will shape the future for gender. Fascinating, uh, uh, Wei Wen. Really interesting to hear how you've got such a strong proportion of women in your senior leadership teams, at least in house, at least in Shanghai. Um, in a nutshell, do you, can you think of a reason or a couple of reasons that have enabled women in Shanghai in-house uh, to perform these senior roles, uh, despite perhaps having families and other responsibilities. Um, do, you, do you know what the secret of success is that we can all try to copy? Uh, I, I shared it with Patrick many times. Uh, I think the number one um, secret in the recipe is the, um, is the uh, grandparents. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, actually, um, I personally Personally, I benefit so much from my parents, you know, uh, taking care of my daughter and enable me never stop uh, in, in, in my career. And also, um, for example, even for this COVID-19, um, I, I, I have so many uh, female lawyers in my team, but because the uh, grandparents are living together, uh, even the kids are at home, so they are they will be able to have the peaceful time and the dedicated time. So the interruption uh, of this, you know, being a parent, parent, uh, being a mom, uh, that the the interruption is actually much less. Well, thank you. Um, and, and you said it in one word, grandparents. And actually, certainly in the UK, that's been a real problem here for women, uh, that women who either previously had paid help or who relied on grandparents, and a lot of people did, they t tend not to live together in the UK. And with COVID-19, we were instructed very strongly not to visit grandparents, not to use grandparents for childcare. And that has really impacted the ability of women to carry on working uh, in this time. So it's really interesting to hear your insights. I'm going to ask you now, please, to turn off your, your mic and camera, and I'm going to invite Quinn Huang to, uh, to join us from Vietnam.
Hello, Quinn. Welcome, Hello. welcome. And um, I'm fascinated to know uh, what your situation has been like in, in Vietnam. Yeah, actually here, very interesting that we hear the case from China. In here, we also have very short uh, time of lockdown. We only have about four to eight weeks uh, lockdown, uh, but the schools closer are uh, much longer. Uh, so here we find that women with uh, young children, with children around, it's quite difficult to handle both uh, work and, uh, and and taking care of the of the housework and the children. Uh, so here we, um, for me and for my friend, I, I can see that my professional lawyers who also found the same issue that they were difficult for us to uh, go through the COVID time. Uh, but uh, here is this quite um, for us, for me, for myself, that I think I can share the experience that I gather uh, the group of two families or maybe three families that we gather children together and then we will have uh, two mothers working together in the house. So whenever I have work that I have to focus on, then I will have the other mother to take care of the whole children. And then uh, vice versa, when the other mother has some engagement, then I will take care of the children. So that's the way I am doing now for, uh, for my kids at home. And uh, the situation in Vietnam, I think is this is maybe similar to other Asian countries where um, most of the time, naturally, women will take the list in housework and in the taking care of the children duties, then uh, most of the time father will not maybe focus on this or maybe they don't really uh, pay any attention to this and they think, okay, I do the, the wife at home and then she can take care of the kids. So he's quite um, not very worrying about what happened at home. Uh, so. It's, it's maybe a um, similar situation. And for, for me at LNT and Partners, we also have the same problem with the uh, uh, gender equality. Uh, we have about 20 or 30 percent female leaders. I mean, we have like 70 percent or maybe 60 percent female associates. But when it comes to the partner level, then we only have about 20 to 30 percent of the uh, female partners, and that would be something that uh, we need to change in the future, I hope. Thank you. So what I'm hearing is that these issues, they exist all around the world, um, mm -hmm. but people come up with slightly different solutions. So in Vietnam there, you were able to club together with your neighbours and friends to share responsibilities. Very interesting for me that it was mothers clubbing together rather than, for example, fathers stepping up um, to an enhanced role, um, but still you found your own solutions, solutions that worked in your particular context where your lockdown was not very severe, um, but very interesting um, to hear what you did there. What would you say, um, do you think, is the is the greatest challenge um, for women um, trying to progress their careers in the law in Vietnam? Um, actually, we have a very strong uh, education in law. Many, um, a lot of, I mean, uh, the majority of uh, female students study laws. We have a lot of female uh, students that, that graduate from the law school. Um, but then when it's come to maybe uh, becoming, uh, joining the legal profession, then it's become, uh, they have to handle many other duties at home. And then it takes them to maybe decide to, uh, to, to change their jobs or to resign just to take care of the family or they have to quit for a certain period of time when they have children. Um, so that's the big issue for them to move to a higher level in the organization. And, and for me at the moment, I don't know how to handle that situation for females. I hope that in the future, there might be some way, some solution for female lawyers. Maybe they, they are allowed to, let, to have to work less hour than female, for example, uh, because they have a lot of duties at home, or maybe female, uh, or maybe they need to get male to uh, share the duties at home so that we can improve the situation.
for female lawyers? Well, thank you. Um, uh, I asked you a very hard question there, and um, but I think um, uh, uh, it was very interesting to hear, just as I think we have across Europe, for example, the same issue of lots and lots of women enthusiastically joining the profession, uh, but then dropping out as their, as their responsibilities increase and they find it difficult to stay the course. Uh, and there you mentioned some, um, some suggestions of, of things that might change and might help. And I know that later on in this panel, we've got quite a future focus, quite a solution focus so we'll perhaps be looking some more at some of those sorts of ideas uh, but for now I'll say thank you very much um, I'll ask you to switch off your camera and mic and I will invite Hanim Hanza uh, to turn on uh, her her hello hello Hanim welcome welcome uh, very nice to have you on board now I know that uh, you actually run a whole law firm network at Zico Law um, and so I'm interested to hear what are your challenges in actually running a network uh, from, from, a gender, from a gender diversity point of view? Thank you, Sally. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Zikolo, we operate across 18 offices in 10 countries in Southeast Asia. So there is diversity in terms of you know, all sorts of just not just gender, but culturally, age and uh, market maturities, for example. As Zikolo itself, we're lucky that 54% um, are in senior women leadership positions. So that helps me a lot as a, um, you know, when I'm running the law firm, my Rex go, so they're very supportive. Um, however, so there's very strong advocacy in the heart of uh, Zico Law in terms of diversity and inclusive uh, VT issues. Um, in terms of kind of COVID where we are um, today, you know, I think I think um, the challenges there, there are many. I think many, uh, a lot of our colleagues have, have mentioned it. Um, and in, uh, in Asia, where we are, South China Sea, where Zico Law operates in the country, we're very lucky that there's a lot of help um, you know, easily available domestic help at home that, that can then um, share the burden in terms of um, these women uh, working from home and, and agile working positions. Yep. Sorry, I had muted myself there because there was a bit of interference in the background. So, uh, But I was saying thank you. Fa fascinating. And really this concept of, of help um, uh, keeps uh, keeps uh, coming up, and in different regions, f people find different sources of help. Um, uh, so, so where you are, it's more customary to be able to have paid help, for example. Um, so, but somebody somebody has to do the job. It, it doesn't go away. Um, I know that just as Wei Wen mentioned, that China is, of course, a huge area that she deals with, and and you are are in an even bigger, diver more diverse region. Um, what are the particular challenges of having to um, cope uh, with with the differences, the regional differences uh, for your network? OK, the first, I think, um, challenge that I found a solution for, I guess, is like, you know, you can't have a solution that fits all. There's no cookie cutter solution. It's very, very different and diverse. So you need to look at each market very differently. You will have the emerging uh, economies like Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia. And then you have kind of like the, um, you know, the mid-market uh, uh, economies like Vietnam, uh, Philippines and, and Indonesia. And then you have the more advanced or rather developed economies like Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand. So the problems that come are very different because they are, um, you know, they come with this, this market maturity issues for this region. So um, one needs to think about that when when come with solutions or challenges when when running as such a diverse whether COVID is you know it's a huge win for diversity whether it's uh, you know undone decades of advancement or catalyst for progress I think these are definitely new conversations because for me we are still at war um, so any solutions if you look at agile working if it's working for people it could be working because we are in war war mode. But once you're out of war mode, some of these solutions may, may be different and may be difficult. If it's a long term, you have to have, you know, working from home, kind of agile working may be very, very difficult. Because one, on one point, you have domestic help, but the domestic help is not, uh, it's very difficult to help on, like, say, education or child care learning, online learning. So that's the one thing that COVID has brought because it's shut down of schools. So, you know, you, you then, when I speak to my partners, my female partners, and even um, lawyers, female lawyers who are, who are mothers, they're saying, yeah, in, although it brings up um, the visibility of fathers to understand the challenges that come with uh, childcare, but when it comes to somehow with, with, uh, with education and online learning, the mothers tend to kind of step up more and, and therefore it becomes difficult. You know, then you have boundary issues in terms of when you work, when you, you care for your child, when you have to come back, you know, get back with a client deadline. 
Um, but what has come from that also, I found, has the understanding by leaders of the firm to kind of, um, you know, the it's all output based. So it's not like you have to deliver something um, within work within nine to five. It's like you work within the time that fits for you, and therefore there's more understanding on in terms of when and how. What what are other some people's non-negotiables and certain things that you need to work like you know I have an eight month old baby, so I have to kind of deal with. 6 to 7 p.m., that's like non-negotiable for any webinar or like calls or whatever with clients because I need to bathe her and feed her to bed kind of thing. So there are certain things that you you work around and people are more understanding because of this, you know, where we are at at the moment. But there's still a lot Thank to go. If yeah. I can interrupt you now, I'm um, uh, really enjoying that, but I'm conscious, I'm conscious of our time pressures here. But thank you ever so much for that. And what I'm hearing loud and clear is, um, is, is actually women setting some boundaries for themselves, setting some priorities, working out what really matters for them, and um, and choosing to kind of fight the big stuff, not the small stuff, um, uh, as we as we all have to make compromises in our in our work and our lives. So thank you very much indeed. I'm sorry to have to cut you short there. Um, and um, I am now going to move to our uh, second poll. By the way, I can see that um, audience, thank you so much. I can see you are sending us in questions. Um, I'm really looking forward to us getting round to addressing those. Um, I think I'm going to save them for the end as we've got such fantastic content from our other panelists um, to, to have first. Um, but to help us lead into what our next panelists are going to say, we're going to have one further audience poll um, to hear your experiences. This one is about who you think carries the primary responsibility for driving change and producing more gender equality. Is it the role of governments and regulatory bodies? Um, is it down to, by organizational leadership, I mean, is it the leaders of law firms, the leaders of companies who should be driving the change? Or is it down to individuals to take ownership of their own careers, um, which uh, chimes a bit with what we were just hearing about, about setting your own priorities. But keen to know, as an audience, what are your views about who carries the primary responsibility? Please vote now. And if I could ask Rahul for the results, please. Great. So we are seeing, uh, and I will just look at this uh, on a on a ah, right. Uh, Rahul, actually, I I am um, uh, I there we go. I need to move something on my uh, on my screen so that I can see. Right. So I can see 21% are saying governments and regulatory bodies, uh, but 58% are saying organisational leadership, and 20% uh, taking responsibility for for yourself. So so really um, a strong majority there putting it down to organisational leadership. And the good news about that is that we have of course many organisational leaders both on our panel and no doubt actually attending this webinar. Um, and so really you are voting uh, for taking action yourselves and taking responsibility. Um, and uh, that is, you know, uh, empowering ourselves, we can actually make change. Um, so uh, that is um, is very good to hear. There's more chance of success when we take responsibility. Um, without further ado, um, I'm going to move on to my next panelist. Um, I'm going to invite Neelam Call to switch on her microphone and switch on her webcam um, uh, to join the discussion. Hi, Neelam. Welcome, welcome. Um, and um, I thought maybe I could ask you to describe a bit what you think of as the, the kind of the mental load that women are carrying during this pandemic. Hi, Sally, and good morning to everyone from London. Um, the mental load, the best way I describe mental load is the invisible work that us women do. So work that is usually, um, you know, unacknowledged work that we don't usually um, get any appreciation for. So it's the invisible work that we do. And mothers obviously um, have been doing a lot of this invisible work during the COVID period. So it's not your household chores. It's not the homeschooling. It's not looking. Um, you know, it's not doing your actual professional work. It's everything else that doesn't fit into those three categories. So it's things like, you know, remembering appointments, checking on elders, 
um, you know, making sure the kids are not having got too much screen time, making sure there's enough um, food supplies, any kind of research. So it's basically project managing. Um, at work, we would call it project management, but at home, it's everything else that the woman tends to worry about. And the thing with this mental load is it usually includes, you know, it usually contains a lot of worry, anxiety, it could be about the future, but this kind of worrying and this project management usually falls upon the women. So um, we've seen a lot of women, I know certainly with a lot of um, my clients who are women in middle management, they tend to be saying that they, you know, not only do they have the burden of homeschooling, the burden of more chores and, you know, putting on the game face for work, but they've got this invisible work and this invisible worry and all these other tasks they have to um, worry about. So that's how I describe the mental load. Thank you. That was really clear for me. Um, but what do you think women can actually do then to help manage that increased burden, that mental load? Mm -hmm. I think firstly, you, you know, being quite clear in your mind, what are these invisible tasks or this invisible work that you are doing that often goes unnoticed and um you know that we don't get appreciated for so knowing what those are and then being really clear and really communicating um with your partner you know being really clear about expectations um you know delegating at home whether it's um you know to your children or whether it's to your partner and also i think somebody mentioned earlier on being really clear with your you know managers with the organization that i can only work within certain times or i need this time off because i am homeschooling so i think it's it's about boundaries, you know, setting clear expectations. And one thing I think that women especially um, seem to contend with is, you know, letting go of being a perfectionist, because a lot of the time we take on a lot of things because we think by the time I explain my husband how to do that, or by the time I get somebody else to do it, I might as well do it myself. It's, you know, a lot less stressful and it's quicker. But I think we have to, especially in this period while we have been in lockdown, I think it's really important to think, you know, want the job half done or it's better it being done, even though it may not be to your usual standards. But you know, kind of like letting go of these perfectionist tendencies of having to do everything your way and having to do it perfectly. I think that's such a valid comment. I've heard so many men mm -hmm. complaining, my own husband's included, about <laughs> uh, being told mm -hmm. what to do and having to do it, uh, you know, the woman's way or my way, right. uh, when there are other ways uh, and other mm -hmm. compromises that can be made. So I think that that idea of perfectionism is a, uh, and getting mm -hmm. away from it is a really important one. Yeah. Thank you so much, Neelam. I will ask you, to, you. to switch off and mm -hmm. I will bring in Shruti Ajitsaria. Mm -hmm. Hi there, Sally. Hi, Shruti. Hi, Shruti. Welcome. Um, I think, um, I, I, yeah, I'm fascinated to know whether you think that, um, I know legal tech is absolutely your space, your area. Do you think that legal tech can be an enabler for change uh, to help us out, out of this um, hole we've got ourselves into? Um, just to, to pick up on a few of the themes, I think that some of the previous panelists have spoken about, one of them being the ability to work flexibly from home. And to give a bit of context, I've worked um, part time for about 10 years and some of that I've worked, you know, maybe a day at home or half a day at home. And I certainly maybe that was coming from myself or was genuinely the perception, but I always did feel that the working from home thing um wasn't treated with as much seriousness as working in the office and it was often felt like that was actually a day off and i think the the, the situation that we've kind of all just come through it is leveling the playing field in the sense that everybody has had to work from home and everybody has had to see that that is real work but the reason why i think legal tech will help to level the playing field is because actually we've also seen that working from home can be really difficult and can come with a set of um you know sort of technological difficulties and what has been nice is to see everybody being able to participate in online webinars like this and everybody being able to use legal tech to replace the printing kind of like the lack of ability to print very very long documents and everybody being able to use collaboration like online collaboration tools to be able to work together in a more um, efficient fashion so i think what legal tech will do is to make it easier for people to work from home and not feel that they are being disadvantaged and to very much feel like they are still part of the conversation that may be happening in the office whereas i think prior to this you know certainly when i was working at home i didn't feel like anyone would even call me let alone 
would I be included in a meeting um, using video cam or would I be invited to collaborate online on a document using Google Docs? So I think definitely there's been a cultural change and the legal tech does exist that, that will enable us to move towards a more fair level playing field. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shruti. Indeed, all these um, all these technologies that we've all uh, got to grips with, uh, men and women, uh, equally during uh, during this pandemic. Um, I know we were talking earlier about the um, women taking on uh, the burdens, the domestic burdens. Um, and um, what do you think it takes to shift um, both women and men out of just naturally allocating the, the burden to women? That really picks up on one of the audience questions that we, we had earlier. I thought you might be ideally placed to, um, to have some views on that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this panel has concentrated on talking about the conversations in the workplace that we need to have and how the workplace needs to be more flexible or maybe we as women can do I suppose to arrange our day or be honest about what we can and can't manage and I always feel like the unspoken discussion is well what do we talk about to our partners about how we manage the load um, and just kind of picking up on the the point that Neelam just made about the invisible load like how honest are we really with our partners about that invisible load um, and I was lucky enough Sally to see you last night and I mentioned to your book um, which is called Fair Play which I'm just going to recommend really to everybody because it is really interesting and it does talk about the invisible load and it talks about um, some of the other things that Neelam was saying you know about being a perfectionist and letting go and letting somebody else do it their way um, but I think actually if you were to ask me what could how can women change the cultural monotony some of that of of but sort of but holding the load I think some of it really comes from how you set your marriage up from the beginning you know my husband has always been a higher earner than me so my job has always taken a sort of a second class citizen um stage in my home and I've always picked up around him because I've always felt that he he was a person that was kind of making the money to to send our kids to school to to pay the food on the table and all of the rest of it and so I think actually even now that I'm a partner in a law firm, I still very much am the second class citizen in our home in terms of my job. And I that is, I think, the thing that needs to reset, at least for me, is at home, how do I encourage my husband to realise that my job is every bit as important? And I think, you know, that does really start very, very early, that conversation, and particularly for women who have children and then spend time out of the workplace, making sure that you reset properly when you go back to work and you're not just going back you know as a kind of like a hobby or something but you're rather you're going back to continue to be an equal partner well, so fascinating, Shruti. I wish we had more time. Um, that book, Fair Play, is absolutely on my wish list. I'm going to be <laughs> buying that. But your points about, um, we, we talked earlier in the poll about responsibility of leaders, but absolutely the, the point also about responsibilities of individuals and discussions uh, with families and husbands. I, I do think we are not prepared, certainly in the UK, as we go through school and education. Nobody talks to about us about these sorts of decisions that we're um, going to have to juggle with and grapple with and the reality of combining work and family and in some ways it needs to be um, something passed down uh, from mother to daughter perhaps about how you should set yourselves up for success in your in your life your career and your marriage um, and about having those conversations um, to, to get yourself into a good pattern but it's never too late it's never too late it's harder <laughs> when things are more entrenched but it's never too late to have those discussions so thank you so much Shruti um, if I can ask you to switch off and I will bring on a uh, Serena Wallace Turner, please. Hi, Serena. Hi, Hi Serena. Um, I'd like to focus on the positives for now, if I can. Um, what positives um, have you taken from, from our way of adapting under COVID, uh, the way we've adapted our working lives, um, that you think you, you personally will be able to carry forward, even hopefully as we, as we recover from the pandemic? Well, firstly, I just wanted to really acknowledge that we've gone through such an extraordinary time where families have lost loved ones, people have found themselves in very vulnerable situations for longer and with less resources than they would have in normal times. And we still don't really know the long term impact on individuals and families. So I think it's really important to take what we have gained from this situation and ensure that we really see it forwards and, and carry on the new work practices and the new relationships that we have with clients or um, in, internally with families and make sure that we see that through going forwards. Um, so within that context, my learnings are from a hugely privileged position. Um, and I'm sure a lot of 
what I'm going to take forward will resonate. And I've heard um, my co-panelists uh, express in the last few moments. Um, firstly, it's really being realistic on professional and personal expectations and finding the right balance, setting those boundaries that you referred to earlier, um, being kinder to ourselves, being clearer on when and how I'm going to work and what my output's going to be um, when I'm facing issues, having open conversations with a team, um, and be, being sort of vulnerable and open um, and making sure that communication works on all sides. Um, and Sally, you touched this on, on this area on your opening, the conversations that I've had with clients um, and internally as well have been far more open and personal, sharing good and bad experiences in the last three months than they have in my 25 year plus career. And that for me has been a huge positive, actually building positive relationships and open relationships with people who I might otherwise not really have, have shared as much before, or they would have shared as much with me. And that's been great. Uh, yes, indeed. These I've certainly experienced that too. This, in a way, strangely intimate conversations with people who might even be strangers um, that Zoom has somehow facilitated or the video calling has facilitated. Um, and so in addition to where we talked about uh, being talking to your own uh, life partner, talking to your colleagues and partners at work, uh, but also talking to clients, because yeah. of course, clients are a huge part of this work burden and work allocation, and they themselves are having to juggle. And so encouraging this open conversation, uh, and recognizing we're all humans and we all have yeah. different uh, things to juggle with. So that's really fascinating. Briefly, um, are there any positives that you've learned from your team? You, you mentioned you have your team meetings. Anything that you would take away that, that your team has taught you um, and things that you will encourage going forward as a result? So our team has worked remotely for years. So the working from home syndrome is, is less of an issue that Truti mentioned. Um, and actually what we said to them at the beginning of, of lockdown in, in March was how can we help you work more effectively? We don't record hours, everything's done on an output basis. And one of the areas um, that we've helped and worked together with the entire team is finding we, we've developed two delivery slots where people turn off their slack we have a pause button on outlook um, so people are not disturbed the two hour sessions during the day twice a day and then they can really do focused work and really um, get their outputs right and concentrate and I think it also really helps them from their personal perspective and they'll say to their husbands or their children look these are two hours I'm not going to talk to you I'm not going to listen to anyone I'm not going to deal with issues other than work uh, and that's been really helpful for us and helpful to them there's no expectation around them responding to emails or, or to Slack communications. And we've let clients know about it. And they have been very much part of that process in terms of that sounds great. And actually we'd love to do the same thing. But again, just circling clients and internal and external people within that conversation on effective work practices has been really, really important. Thank you. Absolutely love that idea. I'm going to try and to build that into my day. Everybody knowing that there's a time uh, where you're available and there's a time where you're not. And I, I think for your psychological well-being that is so important having Absolutely. breaks and downtime as well um, and not to feel guilty about managing some personal issues and exactly. to find find that time in the day so thank you thank you very much for that suggestion I will um, ask you to turn off your mic so that I can welcome uh, Georgia Dawson our final panelist to um, turn on her mic and turn on her camera um, and we'll see Georgia on our screens in a moment I think yes here, here is Georgia. Hi, hi, Georgia. Welcome. Last but certainly not least, um, uh, I, I'm really interested in long-term changes. Your perceptions of long-term changes that you think the experience of going through COVID may have driven um, in the way that people work. Yeah, of course. I, I, mean, I think to a large extent, it remains to be seen how many of the changes we're experiencing now will become um, embedded in organisations and, and ultimately long-term changes in our organisations and in the, the profession more generally. I do think it's incumbent upon all of us, but particularly leaders in organisations to identify the changes that support their strategic objectives. And for most organisations that includes diversity and to ensure that those ones are embedded and to the extent that the problems that we've been talking about today are there and inhibiting um, those strategic objectives, be taking steps to address that um, or mitigate some of those problems. So if you look about some of the things that I think will probably become long term um, and, and embedded changes, there's the tech adoption that we've, we've already talked about. I don't know if people remember seeing that meme that came out probably within the first month of the pandemic becoming global, 
that said who has done more for your organization's um, in, uh, implementation of its digital strategy, the CEO, the CIO, or COVID. And I think that the message was that the COVID really has accelerated most organizations' um, digital strategies and the adoption of technology. And for all the reasons that we've covered, uh, that has been um, particularly useful, I think, for everybody. Um, it allows and supports the um, agility and ability to be working um, remotely. It means that people can travel less, which is good for mental and physical health and also helps the environment. So that will, I think, remain. We've um, already touched upon um, agility and um, for some people, obviously, working from home and the integration of family and, and work has been fantastic. Uh, it's given people more flexibility and it's been really liberating. Um, for others, it's been a really difficult time as, as we've covered and so um, I think the agility will continue and it's then just working out how you address the downsides that we've covered off today. There's an issue then about what you do with your office space, what's the role of an office, is it a collaboration zone, do you need as much space, in that? Um, how do you bring people together um, and create the culture for your organisation. Um, one of the other benefits for us um, and I think for other organisations is that and I think it's a point Shruti touched upon that technology has enabled a more inclusive um, discussion. So you're not, if you're out of sight, you're not out of mind if you're working on an agile basis for people who had a flexible work arrangement before. If you're in a regional organization or a global organization, the right people are being brought around the table to discuss key issues instead of it just being the group of people who happen to be sitting you know, in London, for example, on any given issue. The other thing that I hope is an embedded change is around mental health. I think. It's been on the agenda for many organisations. We've certainly been trying to drive it, but this has really brought it to the fore. It's made it a, a mainstream topic of conversation instead of something that um, is a taboo. I'm not suggesting that the, the issues have fallen away, but it, it, I think it's certainly advanced that dialogue, and I really hope that remains a long-term change too. Well, well, thank you. Um, I think that's a hugely uh, positive note um, uh, to finish this section of the webinar on um, a number of, of what appear to be long term changes that actually do seem to have highly beneficial application for everyone, actually, um, and women in particular in the workplace. Uh, so thank you, Georgia. We got a little bit of trouble with your um, your visual there and the, the sound quality there, but thank you very much indeed. Um, at this Point, we are ready to move over to um, questions from the audience. So if I could ask you, Georgia, if you wouldn't mind to turn off your mic and uh, camera for now, and I'll invite Patrick to switch yours back on again, because I'm hoping that Patrick and I will uh, perform a double act here. Um, Patrick's had a bit more time than I have um, as we've been talking to look at the reams of questions that have been coming in um, from audience members. Um, so um, thank you very much. I have been keeping an eye on them as well. Um, we will, between us, Patrick and I will, 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 um, uh, will read some of those questions out and, and try to bring in a few panel members um, to, to answer uh, those questions. Maybe Patrick, if you'd like to, to start us off uh, with uh, a question that you've seen coming in that you think would be particularly uh, irrelevant to answer. Right, okay. Um, so I've had a chance to sort of concise, you know, make them a little bit concise. So apologies if I if I made them too concise and I've, I've missed the meaning, but um, I've got, I think I've got four to quickly run through. So um, women have proved to be great leaders during COVID. And of course, we've looked at uh, Germany and the fact that there's a chemist, there's a woman in charge there. Um, will this bring a change to the protection of women leadership is, is one question. Um, right, so now um, how are we going to, we want to bring people in, we can't bring everybody in at once. Should we try to bring in, I think we can have up to six people showing at once, can't we Patrick? Should we try to bring in our, our panellists from the first half um, and, and um, uh, perhaps just to switch your, your mics on and your cameras on if you can and, and we, can, we can ask you if you've got uh, a view, answers to those, to that question. Welcome back. Hi. So, um, so perhaps um, Hanim, what are, what are your thoughts there? Sorry, Patrick. Could you repeat that question? So, um, the, the the observation is that, uh, for instance, um, I think it's in Sweden that people are talking about, in New Zealand, and also in Germany, where there have been women leaders. Um, the response has been much better. Does this give this uh, liminal point some gravitas where we can see that women are going to be more respected as leaders as a consequence of COVID? Is that something people think will, will happen or could happen? 
Okay, I mean, let me take you back to ASEAN. Okay, we have also women leaders in terms of President Indonesia, Thailand, Myanmar, the Philippines. But unfortunately, I wouldn't say they were, you know, kind of stellar leaders in that sense, all had some issues. So I think um, gender side, yes, I agree. So I think a strong gender uh, kind of leadership, women leadership can drive changes in, in, in gender issues. But in the end of the day, there's also other attributes, I think, to good leadership that one needs to think about when, you know, kind of, uh, that's my take on it anyway. Sure. I mean, my, my particular view is that people can do maths and also a scientist tend to have a better idea of, of how this thing can spread. So that's something I've observed. Um, any other views? Can I, can I say something about this? Because um, you know, our whole project was around women in leadership in, in law. And um, I don't want to overgeneralize in terms of gender characteristics, but what we did find was that women leaders tended to be more inclusive, more connected, more interested in networking and empowering colleagues. Um, and, and more team focused, less less ego focused. And um, and my reflection on that is, I think those are the qualities that we need in in our world as well as in our in our legal businesses now for to really to build back better, as as the saying goes in the UK, to to set us up for greater success and 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 greater equality. Great. So. We can move on to the next question. And actually, Christina, I'm glad you're on because there's quite a nuanced question here. So I'm just going to read this one out. Um, you touched on intersectionality. And given the recent Black Lives Matter movement, what can be done to provide black women more opportunities? How can their colleagues contribute to this? Well, there, there couldn't be a more important question at the moment, Patrick. Um, and it, and it, is, it is appalling and it is wonderful that um, the, the death of Floyd, George, George, Lloyd and um, George and the, the whole Black Lives Matter movement has really brought this to, to the fore. Because what we uh, found in our research is this is an enormous problem. Um, and it is nuanced. So in the city of London, um, an Asian male is likely to do as well as a white male. But what we know is that right at the, the, the bottom of the, of, of the spectrum are black African Caribbean women. And what we need to do, first of all, it's about recognizing that fact and being uncomfortable with it. And then working out and putting a lot of focus and energy into working out strategies that are actually going to shift the dial. And, and that's that's going right back into the, the talent pipeline. So, so many firms have had some great strategies about engagement with schools and encouraging and supporting um, underrepresented communities to think of careers in, in law um, and then supporting them through um, in, 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 a, in a, a trajectory of a legal career. So um, much more effort needs to be put into that. And what I would say on a policy position is that it is essential um, that law firms and legal businesses hold themselves accountable, that they set themselves targets and that they report on those targets very regularly. Um, that keeps everybody open and honest and, and focused on the solution. Fantastic. Okay, well, thank you. Um, any other comments on that incredibly important topic? Raoul will tell me if some of our other panelists have, have any, any views. Okay. Patrick, I was wondering so, if we should try to bring back uh, to say thank you to our first half panelists and and bring bring on our second half panelists, perhaps for the um, for your next couple of questions. Okay, well, that sounds good. Thank you all. We'll, thank we'll, you. Actually, one thing we'd like everybody to join us at the end, so we'll we'll do that at the end. But um, okay, so we've got another question, which is: um, Are women avoiding senior roles because of young families? Um, so. Are people actually thinking already, well, I, I'm not going to go for that because actually I'm prioritizing having a family. So therefore, kind of making a, a break on their own careers as a consequence of the burdens that they receive. I'm happy to talk to that as soon as I have a young family. Um, I don't know that I, 
I would categorise it as people automatically deliberately putting a break on their careers so much as I would say that often when you have a young family you may want to make different decisions and your priorities may shift and you may for, for example want to work part-time or more flexibly or from home and I think actually up until now those things have made it harder to progress in traditional law firms. So um, I'm going to quote Davis Polk actually I think uh, some folk from Davis Polk are on, on, on as, as uh, um, uh, as, as uh, delegates um, and, and I know they've worked very hard to try and bridge that gap between uh, women partners taking a or women lawyers taking a break and then re-entering and hopefully becoming partners and it's uh, it's been difficult so the question that came in is actually about that situation about how um, interim departures can be handled so that women who will you know obviously have children can then men's their careers at the same point or similar point as to where they were previously? Important question, I think. Anybody want to grab that one? I'm happy to just to talk about um, a returnship program. So, you know, right. Alan and Avery, we've had a returnship program for a very long time. But again, I think, you know, whilst we can say to people, okay, fine, you've been out of this law firm for five years come back it's very difficult to recreate what you know your male counterpart may have had by way of experience in those five years and even for myself you know when I first had my when I had my first child I came back and worked three days a week and I found it very difficult to keep up and you know there are many more conversations about work allocation nowadays it's actually very difficult to get good interesting deals if you are only working three days a week and you have to work for someone who is incredibly considerate and who really deliberately wants to push you forward in order for you to be able to maintain the good work if you're not available to the client all five days a week so um i think much of it isn't deliberate so much as it's just difficult um with the setup that law firms have I think there can also be opportunities to offer different ways of or different types of work as well over a certain period. And I think as an individual, setting your own expectations of how you want to work, what sort of work you want to do, and then try and implement, try and implement that within your employers. Neilan mentioned about the project management skills that you gain as a mother. And I think, you know, that's actually quite an interesting perspective and way of encouraging women to come back into work, doing slightly less fee earning work, but doing more project management work, which might be able to fit in more easily over a certain period, but having ongoing development conversations, I think really key. Yeah. I've got one last question. So sorry if uh, your questions have come in um, and, and we're not going to be able to answer, but we're in the last uh, two or three minutes here. So, uh, but I think it's quite an important one, actually. And I'm, it's a more of an observation, but I'm going to make it into a question, which is, what are you going to teach your daughters? Um, I can take that one. Um, <laughs> I actually have two sons. I don't have any daughters, but I know, again, it's something that I do speak to um, a lot of female professionals about. So I think what we would teach our daughters, I think, I mean, I have three nieces, they're under five, they can run the world at this stage, they're full of confidence, you know, they can take on anything, um, they're good at negotiating, you know, I look at them and I think what happens to these women when they enter the professional world because then comes the lack of confidence, the imposter syndrome, but from a young age I think they are just so, you know, they can be boisterous, so I think what I would teach my um, daughters if I had daughters or what you should what anybody who has daughters would be that you know um, for them to be really clear on what they're good at so what and what I mean by that is that's where the confidence is going to come in so teaching your daughters to be really really clear on what their strengths are really clear on you know what their expertise is and just being sure of themselves and that comes from within as well as from people around you so being really care really careful and mindful of you know who's in your network who's around you and having people that do you know cheerlead lead you but I think it's you know being told and believing that you do have something to offer and that you are special because these young girls believe they're special and you know they're fairies and they believe in unicorns but then for some reason you know as they grow older um, and as they enter, enter the workplace 
um, they have a very different mindset. And one of the biggest things I see with young, um, you know, professional women and middle um, aged um, professional women is that imposter syndrome and that lack of confidence that does hold them back in their careers. Fantastic. So we're coming towards the end. Um, Sally, any last comments that you'd like to make? <laughs> oh, so many interesting things are there. Um, just in answer uh, to, to something ne Neelam said and something Shruti said, um, uh, I'm conscious I've, I've had a message uh, while we've been talking saying that, of course, I totally agree with everything Neelam said about conversations with daughters. Just a reminder that, of course, um, it's not all, again, it's not all for women and daughters to sort out. This is for involvement yeah. uh, in the, with the men in our lives as well. Um, and, and Shruti talked about uh, work allocation. And I've seen how these days, uh, and I know Shruti has a particular interest in tech as well and these days I don't know how many of your firms use them but there are digital tech allocation systems that I think can iron out some of the unfairness that can go with work allocation and can also so that you're seeing another example of how tech can support uh, women's careers but really I just wanted to give my thanks uh, to all our audience and all our panelists and to Patrick um, for making today possible and I will hand back to, to Patrick to sign us out. Okay, so fantastic. So um, I'd like everybody to turn on their webcam that can, okay, because we'll do a kind of goodbye. Um, and also just to tell everybody on that's been listening to us. So thank you very much indeed for joining. I hope you found it useful. If you have found it useful, we will be doing more. But also we have another one at midnight for me and Raoul time, but for North America. Uh, so do encourage your, your your friends to join that and your colleagues. And uh, just to thank you all those that have actually joined us and those that have spoken today really very very much indeed this has been i think a very meaningful exercise and one that we hope has been proving useful thank you all very much and um, goodbye thank you Bye. -bye. Bye.